At the start of this year, I quit my graduate structural engineering job at a global design company that I've been working at for just one year. Ever since I've been working at a small engineering firm, and to say the least, it's been very different. So if I had to sum up my experience and share what it's really been like, here's what I'd say. Now, first of all, every small company is going to be different, but in general, I think it's pretty safe to say that people at small companies tend to both work hard and play hard. I say this because you can find yourself putting in extra long hours during the week, or sometimes even on the weekend around project deadlines, but you can also find yourself playing back-to-back -back table tennis matches in the office on a random Wednesday afternoon. Working at a small company is definitely a unique experience, and for me, often it doesn't even feel like I'm doing a job. It feels more like I'm working on a university project with a couple of friends, but this time we're actually getting paid. I think it feels this way because there's a casual and friendly vibe around the office, there's flexibility around when and what time I get my work done, and most importantly, there's project ownership. What I mean by this is that similar to when you're a student and your professor gives you an assignment, when you give a project, it's completely on you to make sure it gets done and is completed on time. Now obviously with this comes a lot of responsibility, but also a lot of fulfillment. Anyways, with that being said, in this video I'm going to try and give you a full rundown on what it's really like to work at a small engineering company. I'll go into more detail on what my company does and what I do in my role as a structural design engineer, I'll go over what my daily schedule looks like, and then at the end I'll cover some of the pros and cons. Okay, so simply put, the company I work for designs buildings, and as far as I can tell, there's no limit to the size or nature of these buildings. So this means we'll take on the design work for big projects like high-rise apartments and offices, mid-sized projects like factories and warehouses, and also small projects like residential houses and commercial office buildings. In particular, the company that I work for is well known for its ability to design post-tension concrete structures, but like I just mentioned, that's only a fraction of the projects we're working on. Anyways, now that you know a bit about what my company does, what exactly do I do as a structural design engineer? Well, as the name suggests, I work on the structural design of buildings. At the moment, I find myself working on projects in the small to medium sized range, so that basically means that anything that's not a high rise building could come my way. For example, that means that on one day I could be designing a steel frame structure for a big sports hall, and then on the next I could be designing a residential house or anything associated with a house, like a carport or a pool. Now, how exactly does a structural design engineer go about designing a building? Well, to answer that, let me explain the general structural design procedure that we use at work. And to help me better explain, let me use a little granny flat project as an example. Okay, so the first thing we do is have a flick through the architectural drawings and the soil report. When we're looking through the architectural drawings, we're taking notes of things like how big the structure is, what the roof shape is, and in some cases, what material the architect is wanting to use in specific areas. Likewise, when we're looking through the soil report, we're taking note of things like the soil classification and at what depth we have an adequate bearing capacity. Second, we would mark up a footing plan and a slab plan. Now, assuming that we have good soil and we don't need to do a deep footing like a board pier, for something like this, we would usually just do a stiffened raft slab. And what this is, is basically a grid of reinforced concrete beams in the ground that are connected by a common top slab. And the point of this is to limit the effects of ground movement and to distribute the load somewhat evenly onto the soil. Third, we would mark up a roof framing plan. For a little structure like this, it would be pretty typical for it to be framed up using timber, so depending on whether the architect wants a rake ceiling or a flat ceiling, we would then size up the appropriate roof members and size the wall framing. For a rake ceiling, this would be a combination of king posts, rafters, and a ridge beam, and for a flat ceiling, this would be the rafters and the ceiling joists. Also on our roof framing plan, we need to show the size of any lintels or roof beams, which are the members that we have on our load-bearing walls that carry the roof loads over the top of any windows or doors. Okay, and next is connections and tie downs. For a lightweight structure like timber, we're of course worried about downward loads from the weight of the structure itself and any live load, but usually what we're more worried about is the roof flying off under high wind pressures. So besides making sure that the connections work just under downward loads, we also spend a great deal of time making sure that each member is properly tied down to one another and then eventually all the way down and into the slab. Okay, and the final part of the design procedure is to mark up a brace plan. Basically what we do here is we work out how much horizontal force is going to be acting on a structure from the winds and then we specify the required amount of bracing to stabilize the structure. For our cabin example, the type of bracing we might use is plywood bracing, strap bracing or K-frame braces. That being said, let's talk about what the daily schedule looks like. I usually wake up around 7.30, have a shower and some breakfast, then I'm at my desk either at home or in the office by around 8.30. In the morning I usually always get straight into some design work for a couple of hours. 
If I'm at home, this is usually a pretty productive solo session without any interruptions. And if I'm in the office, this is usually a combination of working on my designs alone and also going and getting mentoring and help from the senior engineers. After lunch, I usually get back into some more design work or some drafting of my designs for one or two more hours. And then around 3 p.m. is usually when I'll need to pack up and head out to site if I've got any inspections. Inspections definitely aren't an everyday thing, but they do fluctuate depending on what stage of construction my projects are in. After work, I usually go to the gym for an hour or so, and on some days, depending on how I'm feeling, I just go straight home and relax. After dinner, depending on if I have a lot of work to do, I might do a little more, but I only really do this if I have a tight deadline coming up and I'm running out of time. All right, now let's talk about some of the pros of working at a small company. Number one is the casual environment. At small companies, nobody cares if you come into the office wearing jeans and a hoodie, and there's definitely no expectation that you come into the office wearing anything too formal, like a dress shirt or a suit. Likewise, there's also quite a bit of flexibility around when and where you do your work. What I mean by this is that if you want to get into the office at 10 a.m. or leave the office for an appointment throughout the day, no one minds. And the same goes for working from home. There isn't going to be any strict rules about when you need to be in the office, so if you want to work from home, you just do it. The vibe is very much as long as the work gets done, we don't care where or when you do it. Number two is local projects. At small companies, majority of the projects you work on are from local people, so that means that the things that you're working on are always close by. And why this is a pro is because it actually allows you to see your designs be built and face all the challenges that come along with that. At university, we spend a lot of time doing the theoretical stuff and not a lot of time learning how things are actually constructed. So there's quite a lot for us to learn in this area and you aren't gonna get this experience if your projects are far away. Okay, and finally, one of the coolest perks of working for a small company is the level of project ownership. At small companies, you're never gonna be sitting around bored or given meaningless work to do because there's usually a lot of engineering work that needs to be done and if they hire you, they're not gonna waste you. At small companies, when you're given a project, that project becomes yours and it's on you to get it done. So that means it's completely up to you to analyze, design and document each part of that project. Now, obviously this can be an overwhelming feeling at the start, but the cool thing is that you'll just learn so much during each project that your improvement and your development will be massive. Now, nothing's perfect, so let's talk about some of the cons. First, small companies are small because they are making a lot of money. So this means that if the company suddenly stops winning work or the world goes into another recession, the company may not survive and the likelihood of you losing your job is a lot higher than at a larger company. Second, you might make less money. At the junior level, generally you can expect to make up to 10% less than those at a larger company, but this isn't true everywhere, but it's just something to be aware of. Third, you have less access to resources and design software. Licenses for structural analysis programs can be quite expensive, so often small companies won't pay for a lot of these. So this means that you're gonna have to do a lot more calculations by hand and do things perhaps the long way. For a young engineer, I actually think that this can be quite beneficial because it better allows you to understand the fundamentals and develop a bit of engineering judgment, but over time it does get annoying because it's not as efficient. Anyways, I hope you learned something from this video and if you did enjoy it, you might like this video here where I talk about the structural design procedure in a lot more detail or that video there where I talk about how I would learn structural engineering if I were to start over. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.